Hello everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started here. I'm Suzanne Wunz, I'm the Executive Director of the Harvard Law School Library, and on behalf of the library I'd like to thank you all for coming to tonight's book talk on Unstable Constitutionalism, Law and Politics in South Asia, edited by Mark Tushnet and Madhav Kosla. We're going to be raffling off two copies of the book, um, so these little slips here are the raffle entries. Once you've filled them out, you can put them in the glass jar that June Casey's holding up over there. And uh, we're going to notify the winners uh, by email, so you'll hear tomorrow who won. Um, so <laughs> I, I would just like to make a couple of housekeeping notices. One is that the talk today is being videotaped, so if you ask any questions during the questions and answer period at the end, uh, those will be part of the recording. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce tonight's panelists. So we have... Um, Professor Mark Tushnet, the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and co-editor of today's book. And we also have Nicholas Robinson, resident fellow at the Center of Legal Profession here at HLS, and Rohit Day, associate research scholar in law at Yale Law School and assistant professor in the Department of History at Yale University. Thank you all. Mark, do you want to start? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. My job is basically just to introduce the panel <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, give a series of thank yous. So first, thank you to the library for arranging this event and doing all the logistical stuff associated with it, which is uh, always an important phenomenon. Um, second, I want to thank the various uh, entities at Harvard that provided support for this project, uh, in particular the South Asia Now Institute. Uh, which provided important financial support in connection with a conference that we held to uh, begin to put this uh, project in shape, uh, and uh, the uh, several components of the, uh, I think of them as the uh, international studies elements at the uh, law school uh, administered by Professor William Alford. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, to uh, uh, Madhav Kosla, who's not here. Uh, he's in India working on his dissertation research, but this project was basically Madhav's idea. Uh, he came to me uh, and said it seemed to him that there was probably something worth doing on constitutionalism in South Asia. And in particular, uh, that uh, perspectives from scholars in the region would be quite helpful in expanding the domain or the uh, subject matter of uh, comparative constitutional law. Uh, just as a minor bit of background, uh, if you look at the field of comparative constitutional law, it is heavily dominated uh, by, um, call it, Atlantic scholarship, that is US, uh, European, um, the Commonwealth countries, uh, and with some but relatively uh, little contributions either from, or maybe either about, or more significantly from other regions in the world. Um, and there is now a, a, a literature on uh, the uh, northern nature of comparative constitutional studies or a critique from the global south. Uh, and uh, Mata thought, and, and I agreed, that it would be useful to see what we could get uh, on the, the region uh, m again, mostly from scholars uh, from the region. I think uh, only one of our contributor contributors, aside from me, is not uh, from South Asia. Um, uh, so that's the, that's the genesis of this. Uh, I wanted to say one word about, you know, a paragraph or two about the um, substance of the collection. Uh, and in particular about the title. Um, the title and the theme that we state in the uh, introduction uh, came out of uh, reflecting on 
the initial contributions that we had from the contributors, we actually didn't give people guidance about what to write. Uh, that we, we picked people who knew about the nations they were writing about and then just asked them to write uh, on some dimension of uh, constitutionalism in the nations that they uh, knew about. Um, but it seemed to me in particular that in listening to and reading the preliminary presentations, uh, there was a theme uh, which is captured by the phrase, in some sense an odd phrase, unstable constitutionalism. Uh, what I meant by that, and Mott you know, went along, I guess I'd say, is that um, most of the contributors uh, describe situations in which um, participants in constitutional discourse, including drafters and uh, politicians, regard um, the creation of a constitutional order as either essential for or desirable uh, for the creation of uh, stability in uh, their nations, which have experienced instability in, in a variety of forms and for a variety of reasons. But constitutionalism holds out the hope to all of these participants <clears throat> of a stable solution. Uh, and that's what they're committed to, constitutionalism as generating stable solutions to the problems of instability that each nation has uh, confronted. But it turns out that that commitment is itself, the commitment is um, constant, I'd say, I mean, overstating it, uh, but uh, manifests itself in ways that are in unstable within each system. So the idea is, again, this is oversimplifying it, the idea is that at time one in, let's say, Bangladesh, there's a vision of a constitutional settlement that will permanently stabilize the nation. But at time two, another vision of a settlement that will permanently stabilize the nation comes into being. And so you get this kind of instability in pursuit of a stable solution to the national uh, problems. I should say that, that there was one uh, contribution uh, from Sangha Welakala about Sri Lanka uh, that rejects this conceptualization uh, uh, because he uh, sees the Sri Lanka settlement as now um, stabilized, uh, but in a uh, uh, strongly, in his view, anti-constitutional way, uh, because he gives uh, constitutionalism uh, a thicker substantive content <coughs> than my description of constitutionalism uh, has. <coughs> so. Um, that's sort of what I saw and uh, Mata saw as the theme of the work. Uh, there are, in my view, a number of extremely interesting, discrete analyses uh, of nations and, and one contribution of this uh, collection is uh, to bring to the attention, uh, to, to expand the database uh, on which comparative constitutionalists can work. Uh, just so, as an example, there, there's, a, I think, a quite wonderful chapter on Bangladesh about the use of the chief justiceship as the mechanism for what are purportedly interim or caretaker governance, governments, but that actually are the government for quite a long time. Uh, that's just an interesting fact of which I was completely unaware and, and you know, I follow a fair amount of stuff. So it suggests to me that this database uh, uh, contribution may also be significant. So I want to say I don't know a lot about constitutionalism in the region beyond what these articles did and uh, what these chapters did and uh, some other reading about India in particular, but I think 
in some ways, an important contribution of the work is to expand the sense of uh, constitutionalism in the region beyond India. So I am now uh, uh, in a position to say I am really quite interested in seeing what uh, Nick and Rohit have to say about the topic, I'm not necessarily about the book, but just about the topic. So I will stop and turn it over. We didn't really organize this, but um, yeah. right to left. Nick. Okay, I'm sure. Happy to. Um, thank you, um, and thanks for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here to celebrate this book. Um, I'm constantly amazed by the, the not only the breadth of your scholarship, whether it's U.S. constitutional law or comparative constitutional law, but also you know the real pioneering and incredibly substantive ways in which you engage. And I don't. And this book is uh, no exception. And you're really able to bring together a superb group of scholars in South Asia. Um, and I want to emphasize just how difficult this is to do. Um, Many of these countries have really nascent legal academies. Um, it can be difficult to identify who the appropriate people are to contribute and then get over all the logistics involved, um, as, as, you, <laughs> as you're smiling now, <laughs> um, to make sure that uh, you can bring them together and they can, uh, can contribute. And I think it really speaks um, to the, the respect you inspire, your, your intellectual capaciousness, um, uh, your tirelessness, um, and your underlying scholarly generosity um, that you were able to convene, convene this group, um, which really is some of uh, the leading lights um, in terms of scholars who do this sort of work on constitutionalism in South Asia. And I'm not going to try to encapsulate all of the chapters here. Um, uh, I think, as you mentioned, there's uh, uh, several chapters that I think are major contributions in their own right, just stepping away from this project, uh, whether that's uh, Pratap Banumita has a, has a wonderful chapter um, talking about how the Indian Supreme Court is very difficult to fit into traditional narratives about what courts do and argues um, that it's um, much better to view it as a conflict manager um, in India. Or um, a scholar I hadn't been aware of, but you had uh, just mentioned a young scholar, uh, Asanga uh, Wilakala, um, who has this fascinating account about Sri Lanka and how it's best viewed as, as plurinational or as two nations uh, sharing the same state. Um, but what I want to do with my limited time is to really focus on the title of this book and, and the unifying idea that you brought up, which is um, unstable constitutionalism. And I think that this term um, is, um, is quite useful. And the core of the idea, as you say, is that all these countries, um, that most of the participants, if not all of them, are committed um, to an idea of constitutionalism, um, but that they struggle to settle on stable institutional structures. Um, and I think this creates a helpful um, organizing idea for dialogue across South Asia um, and opens up a space for further work, for further theorization, for further debate um, that I'm sure will inspire um, a number of other scholars going forward in this area. And I want to push you just on, on three fronts, or push the idea on three fronts. Um, so the first is the question of regional constitutional identity or, or uniqueness to South Asia. And some of the authors mentioned this in their, their chapter contra, uh, contributions, that you could use the same idea of unstable constitutionalism to describe um, countries in the West um, and certainly countries in, in Southeast Asia, Latin America, um, or Africa. And I think in general, um, one thing that's been striking to me is South Asia doesn't have a particularly strong sense or self-conscious sense of constitutional identity. Even though it has these shared British roots, I think this is partly um, coming out of uh, partition, kind of the, the dominant role that India plays, sometimes an antagonistic role that it has with some of its neighbors, and yet there are these shared British roots. Um, there's similarities in, in socioeconomic background of, of many citizens. There's shared religious and, and, and ethnic groups. Um, and even I think there's some potentially shared understandings among judges um, about what political and constitutional development means 
in their countries. And, and I'd love to get your perspective um, as an outsider, um, to some extent, and an insider, kind of an outsider insider, um, about how, what strikes you as different about unstable constitutionalism in the South Asian context? Or I, I think also part of the strength of the idea is it also unify, connects it to other parts of the world um, at the same time, and you can make uh, comparisons there. Um, second, you point to some common causes about unstable constitutionalism. Um, so the military, uh, religion, um, ethnicities, and some common responses that you see across these countries. Um, whether that's increased judicial activism, different experiments with federalism. Um, and so another question here is what, what kinds of lessons can we learn here um, that can be shared either across these countries um, or from this region of the world um, to other parts of the world. So take, for example, uh, the striking power of, of courts in South Asia. And I don't want to overstate this argument. There's plenty of ex examples in each South Asian country of incredibly pliable um, courts. But one of the common themes um, that you see in a number of the chapters, whether it's discussions about India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, even uh, Nepal, is how the courts have played this critical role in the political histories of these nations. And even some have claimed, you know, they've, they're these overactive judiciaries, and perhaps they've gone too far in a number of these settings, which is not a complaint that you sometimes hear necessarily in, in all other parts of the world. Um, and what uh, when we do this comparison about judicial activism, you know, are there lessons that can be learned about when it happens, when it's successful, unintended consequences? Um, and even just kind of more pragmatic um, or prescriptive interventions as, as well of kind of a comparative exercise. So for example, um, one of the big debates in India is about whether the Indian Supreme Court uh, sits in panels. Um, there's demands by many in the southern part of the country and some of the other parts of the country that the court should have different bench benches in different parts of the country um, so that it could be more accessible um, uh, uh, to, 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 to citizens in these regions. Um, and there's lots and lots of discussion about this. The members of parliament will talk about it. But one thing that struck me is it's almost never mentioned that this is exactly how Pakistan organizes its Supreme Court, where the Pakistan Supreme Court sits in, in benches in different provinces of the country. And so if you wanted to think about it in the Indian context, um, what might be the consequences of having these benches that sit in different parts of the country, looking to Pakistan, looking to neighbors, um, might be a, a, a helpful mode of analysis even within South Asia. And I'm curious if you see other kinds of um, uh, areas that are ripe for analysis. And that, that, that's one that certainly has always struck me. And then finally, I wanted to push you on this question of methodology. Um, and so in his chapter in this book, uh, Sujit Chaudhary, who actually just became uh, the dean of uh, Berkeley Law School, um, points to, uh, uh, makes an argument that there's a gap in the literature um, about how uh, judgments are uh, discussed in South Asia, that they're too often discussed in a vacuum or a void away from kind of the const uh, the constitutional politics and history um, of the nation. And that, you know, it's really a plea for a sort of qualitative contextualism that I think a lot of the authors and a lot of the chapters really take some inspiration from, if not from Sujit's analysis, from that, that, that uh, chain of reasoning. But as you know, there's something of a schism in comparative constitutional law right now. Um, and so, you know, there's another, there's another set of really pioneering and influential work by the likes of Tom Ginsburg, of David Law, that's much more statistical um, and quantitative, um, comparing how, different how many different constitutions in the world have this right or this structure or share this language. Um, and you could imagine similar work being done in South Asia. So, for example, within the constitutions of South Asia, many of them share language 
um, in their constitutional provisions and how have these been interpreted. Many major pieces of, 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 uh, of legislation, including things like criminal law, um, because of shared British roots, um, have similar language. Um, you could even do, I could, you could imagine statistic, uh, some sort of quantitative analysis about particularly countries outside of India. India doesn't tend to cite judgments very much from other countries in South Asia, but other countries in South Asia do um, cite the Indian Supreme Court. They do cite um, other uh, Supreme Courts in the region. And you could see how these ideas go from one jurisdiction to the another, whether that's being adopted as an idea or being reacted to as an idea. Um, and so, as you know, there's so much work to be done in South Asia. Um, but there's also, yeah, one level you just want to say, we should do everything, right? We should just explore kind of all methodologies, um, all these topics, whether it's the basic structure doctrine or federalism or judicial activism or public inter interest litigation, all these need to be explored. But there's limited academic resources within South Asia. Um, I think you do have to be somewhat strategic about it. Um, and so I wonder what you think are the most useful places for comparative engagement, and how perhaps maybe this idea of unstable constitutionalism fits into that or could provide an umbrella for some of that work. So I think I'll end there. Um, but I, as I said, your book's an incredibly important achievement, I think, and will be wonderfully generative um, for uh, uh, an area of, of comparative law in South Asia, which is really very much in its early days. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Dashnit, and um, for for inviting me to uh, discuss this book. I want to echo Nick in saying this is really a remarkable uh, collection of essays that add uh, a lot, both empirically and methodologically, in understanding uh, the region. And I particularly want to gesture, in terms of methods, uh, Mara Malagodi's article, which looks at literally relates the physical architecture of legal buildings in Nepal to the changing sort of contours of Nepali constitutionalism. Um, at, and, 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 but what I want to actually talk about in my, in, in my comments is how this book uh, really offers an original way um, and I think an important way of thinking about the purpose of comparative constitutional law more broadly, uh, not just limited to South Asia. So maybe begin with, I'd like to begin perhaps thinking about why study South Asia. Um, it's a, um, a collection of countries that are linked by geography. Some share a common history, but others don't. Uh, it's a set of disparate systems. It includes at various points of time a constitutional monarchy, presidentialism, military presidentialism, French semi-presidentialism in Sri Lanka, and a parliamentary democracy in India. It includes an uh, ethno-Buddhist state, a uh, Hindu kingdom, uh, a Buddhist kingdom, uh, Islamic republic, a former Islamic republic, and a secular republic that's struggling to stay secular. Um, so maybe we can think about what are the various reasons why people do comparative constitutional and what are the models. Uh, one very common one seems to be the United Nations model of constitutionalism, which Nick referred to, which is let's create a database where we fill in the data from every country in the world and perhaps distill common norms and practices and look at how they move. The second, and that's been very common, particularly with the South Asia scholarship, is there are questions of interest to particularly American but also European constitution constitutionalism. What does South Asia have to offer on that? And there's a distinct number of essays which look at the citation of international law or foreign judgments in the Indian courts, something which is of completely unremarkable and of no interest to most Indian scholars because this is just how common law operates. You cite foreign judgments and there's no legitimacy uh, crisis about it. The third is to look for spectacular difference. And if you look at a certain Westlaw search, uh, you'll find an overrepresentation of pieces talking about a couple of issues. The permanent, uh, the personal law system in South Asia, which allows for religious family laws to exist within a secular state, and a focus on the unamendable constitutional amendments, which really see, is seen as an innovation of South Asian jurisprudence. And the fourth is a slightly embarrassed approach put forward by several scholars of South Asia of an early generation, which sees a South Asian constitutionalism in some ways as inauthentic, uh, as hostage to politics. Um, Radhika Kumar Swami, the Sri Lankan scholar, described it as a sort of um, bastard child of Anglo-American constitutionalism, an import from outside, not really rooted to the society that it governs. And this echoes through many other narratives. So I, I'm reminded of a, a, a short story by the Urdu short story writer Sadat Hassan Manto called Naya Kanun. Uh, and here, here he talks about uh, the 1935 Government of India Act, which is coming in. And his protagonist is a, is a Tangawala, uh, uh, um, sort of poor man who 
uh, drives a horse town cart around Lahore, who's excited about this idea of this new constitution. So he keeps telling his passengers a new constitution that's coming, that's going to end oppression, that's going to change things. And the constitution is finally announced. And that day he uh, sees a, a, a British uh, gentleman standing on the road. He reminds that the British, he's reminded of the fact that this British guy had told him off earlier. So he insults him and he says that, you know, uh, knocks his hat off his head and says, the new constitution is in place and I can, I can do this to you now. And then obviously the British man calls the police and the police beat Mangu up and they drive him up, drive, and they drag him away kicking and screaming. But he keeps shouting, but there is a new constitution, there is a new constitution, and he's taken into prison. And this short story is often used by people to point to the fact that despite the fact that South Asia has, in terms of its texts, many progressive constitutions, social reality remains very different, uh, politics dominates constitutionalism, and in some ways constitutionalism is a sham, is a spectacle that's fooled the people of the region. But what I think is captured by this book uh, really well is that despite the politics and the politicking, there is an investment in the idea of constitutionalism. Um, and uh, Mark, of course, uh, picked uh, unstable constitutionalism as the title, but the other term that's used uh, a couple of times in the introduction is rambunctious constitutionalism, which I think in some ways captures it even better, a sense that um, the constitution matters. Uh, and, and this comes through, uh, again, in the introduction very, very beautifully, um, where it says that it's important to understand that even though many of these legal struggles are shaped by external politics and often petty politics, there is a concern of putting this through a legal arrangement. The debates are through legal forums, and the emphasis to do this through legal terms. And uh, particularly, I'm mean, reminded of this because as we speak uh, in Nepal, there are protests around the streets, there are demonstrations, there's firing about about fixing certain terms in the Nepali constitutionalism, constitution, which deals with uh, which deals with uh, um, um, federalism. Um, so why is this important? Why is it important to capture uh, a particular uh, cited practice of constitutionalism, which 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 offers something, uh, which, which which offers something qualitative? And I think uh, it's to perhaps caution us from certain models of doing comparative law uh, and comparative constitutional law. Um, so there's an older sort of uh, body of work arising from Jeremy Bentham, which is trying to find a distillation of the models and practices of legislation uh, going back to the 19th century. And uh, uh, this model of comparative law seeks to sort of define a norm and then try to see to what extent is the norm followed. And what often happens is most of the world, uh, so Asia, Africa, Latin America, is defined as falling outside the norm as a deviation from the norm. But I think what scholars like Partha Chatterjee have asked us to do is to recognize the fact that many of these norms are as essentially arise out of the historical practices of Western Europe and North America. So naturally, the rest of the world is then has to be explained as a deviation. Uh, what this book offers is to treat the historical experiences of South Asia as norm-generative in itself and as theory-generative as itself. And it comes through really clearly in both Pratap Mehta and uh, Sujit Chaudhary's essays. And Chaudhary invites us to think about what are the issues that are important for the courts and, 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 and peoples of South Asia and to define the questions from those places itself. Um, so what does this, you know, uh, wh 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 what does this sort of generation of, 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 of theory in the East leave us, uh, and, and what is exciting about it? Um, so again, if you go back to what Western normative theory is based on, it's often based on a certain kind of sequential development. So uh, very schematically, we have a commercial society emerging some point of time in the 16th century. This leads to the birth of civic associations, the development of rational bureaucracies, industrialization, universal adult suffrage, and the welfare state. But the experience of colonialism sees the existence of a rational bureaucracy before industrialization. We see the in, in, a bringing in of universal adult franchise before industrialization and the welfare state. So really, how we think of theory develops when we, it changes when we look at the practices of South Asia. And when we're thinking about norms and institutions for other parts of the world, perhaps South Asia is a richer space to explore it uh, uh, th 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 than other regions, because much of this is, con is in constant flux. And in a way, I would argue that instability, in some ways, is actually a virtue uh, rather than uh, something to be decried because it allows for the generation of new norms and it allows for those who have been shut out of the constitutional order to find a way in, to disrupt existing practices and disrupt uh, 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 elite consensuses. So uh, just very briefly, uh, uh, I just want to raise a set of questions that arise out of one central theme that's common to all the works, and, and, and Nick referred to it, uh, which is the role the judiciaries play in South Asia. So, uh, and, and really a methodological question about how do we read judgments. So as Pratap Mehta points out, um, while we are theorizing how judges are behaving, and we are theorizing judicial norms, it's unclear that judges themselves feel bound by this form of normative theory. So what really are judges bound by, and what do judges think of when they're actually making decisions? decisions. Um, the second, again, uh, I think Nick referred to is an institutional practice, is that when we talk about judiciaries in South Asia, we're not talking about uh, a group of judges who remain in place for an extended period of time. 
uh, judges often sit in panels. So a constitutional judgment is decided often by three judges of the Indian Supreme Court, the Pakistani Supreme Court. Um, and judges often have very short terms in the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court is in some ways a rotating uh, group of judges who cycle in, sit in panels, and leave very soon. So how do you then discern a judicial philosophy that is not linked to a particular individual and is not explicable by a particular individual's um, class or uh, 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 ideological uh, biases. Um, lastly, uh, uh, I, I, I like to think, again, this comes through the Bangladesh paper most clearly, is the kind of political role that judges begin to play. So Bangladesh formalizes this by essentially saying the chief justice runs the country as, as, a, during the, as, as a caretaker when elections are being held. But more recently, when we look at both Nepal and uh, Sri uh, sorry, both uh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, we see that um, uh, the courts have, the, Chief justices become sites of attacks, and judges are removed by political masters, in one case a, de a general, in the other case a popular president. And in both cases, the chief justice is the comeback, often on the shoulders of a powerful lawyer's movement where lawyers take to the streets, engage in civil disobedience, and assert for the rule of law to come back. But the rule of law is defined as a particular chief justice who will come back and, and, and take up office. Um, so I want to close again by saying that this is an enormously important and provocative book, not just for thinking about South Asia empirically, but thinking about what is it that comparative constitutional law should do more broadly. Thank you. <clears throat> I just want to say a few things in response to these extremely generous comments, uh, and then uh, open it up for a discussion uh, with, uh, uh, with the audience. Um, I, First, uh, there are a series of comments about um, the nature of the regional inquiry here. Uh, and um, there, it, it's, there's an interesting question about whether regions are, in fact, coherent um, objects of inquiry for a comparative enterprise. Um, there are, you know, if, there are works on East Asian constitutionalism and now this South Asian constitutionalism and Latin American constitutionalism. Um, and it's not clear to me that there is uh, much to be said uh, about those, with one exception, uh, which is that this is my interpretation of the, the literature with respect to every region, now again, overstating it, um, what happens is that there is a local, call it hegemon, that's not exactly the right term, but uh, a local dominant nation, which uh, strongly affects constitutional understandings or constitutional identity in the other nations of the other, other nations of the region. Uh, sometimes uh, by emulation, uh, sometimes by what Kim Shepley calls aversive constitutionalism. So in East Asia, constitutional identity is shaped by the fact that we are not China. Uh, and in Latin America, it's shaped by uh, we uh, need to get out from under the United States. Um, I'm not sure how much, uh, much more can be said about this kind of thing, uh, particularly when you take into account the now well-established proposition at the policy level and the constitutional level that the primary, um, if you take a constitutional provision in nation A, um, the primary, and try to measure its similarity to constitutional provisions elsewhere, the index of similarity will be highest for neighboring countries. It's just there's a phenomenon of diffusion that occurs. And so, uh, which is, it doesn't tell you much about the system in the, in the, in the, na the, the national systems. Um, that is tied to the, the um, uh, Nixon interest in methodology. Um, I just, uh, I, I, am, I am a case study kind of person, not a quantitative person, but I, I, these indices of similarity, once you take the diffusion, diffusion into account, are uh, use, useful. Uh, I actually had the libraries, thank you again, statistical consultant, do something for me over the summer to generate a word cloud about uh, three Latin American constitutions. Uh, and you look at the cloud, and it's actually quite 
interesting, different from what you get when, uh, with a word cloud of the United States or the uh, Canadian uh, constitutions. So there is stuff to be done uh, along those lines. Um, then the, the uh, just one last observation about courts, both, both uh, Rohit and, and Nick raised questions about uh, courts. Here's a, um, a thought that I, I derive from these materials and also uh, David Landau's work on Latin America. Uh, the thought is that, my terminology here is gonna be a little messy, but the thought is that in thinking about courts, what you need to do is think about um, comparative capacity within the democratic, within the national uh, institutional order. So uh, what Landau talks about is the growth of uh, judicial power in Colombia because, on his argument, the political parties are unable to organize policy making. Uh, and there's a need to get policy made, so comparatively, if the parties can't do it, then the courts will do it. Um, my other uh, example is actually the, it comes from the Pakistani experience, and, and this is a sort of snarky, but not entirely inaccurate way of saying it. Um, the reason for the attraction of the courts in Pakistan uh, was that uh, although the courts were corrupt, they were less corrupt than anybody else. Uh, and so if you're looking for something fairly decent, not decent, but better than the alternatives, courts were an okay place to go. Um, I think that kind of internal comparison of, as I say, governing capacity is likely to be a productive way of uh, pursuing the, uh, the uh, comparative enterprise. Okay, so with that, I will uh, moderate. Uh, if there are questions or comments, uh, yes, uh, do we need the, yeah, there's a, this is for purposes mostly of recording uh, because I know you can project well enough. <laughs> Uh, thank you, professors. This was a very interesting talk, and I had the opportunity, thanks to Professor Tushner, to read uh, some sections of the book over the past couple of days. Uh, I really liked uh, your comments, Professor uh, Robinson, about uh, the shared identity of, uh, as far as, I'm, I'm from Pakistan, and um, I, I think at least from Pakistani jurisprudence and Bangladeshi jurisprudence, there is a sort of a shared constitutional identity between India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, because uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh tend to cite uh, Indian uh, Supreme Court and even High Court judgments uh, quite a lot in uh, both the High Courts and the Constitutional Courts, uh, and the, sorry, the Supreme Court. And I was actually surprised to know that in India they don't have registries for the Supreme Court like we have in uh, all the provincial capitals. That's an interesting thing for me to learn. Uh, the most uh, striking comment for me, however, was that of Professor Roy Day when um, he said that instability, you said that instability provides a way in for the downtrodden to find uh, a way into the political system. And uh, I think that's one place where this book fails uh, because uh, the authors of the book, particularly Professor uh, Muhammad Asim and Professor Sadiq, have failed to take into account the contribution of Chief Justice Chaudhry in uh, instituting the human rights cell of the Supreme Court of Pakistan and uh, of um, his uh, expansive use of Article 184.3 of the Constitution of Pakistan, which provides for the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court to issue writs against the government. Uh, in, uh, after the, the, he was in, uh, he was, even before he was restored, uh, before the whole lawyer's movement took place, he took at least 11 uh, Suwamoto notices in his first six months, and he also issued the judgment w uh, in the Hisbah Bill case, which completely stopped the rise of Islamism in the country. Uh, which would have gotten much worse than it uh, were, than it, uh, what otherwise happened later on. And uh, also it doesn't take into account the fact that uh, a number of very positive developments took place uh, on the judicial legislative front uh, in the acid violence case and the Aslam Khaki case where rights were granted to uh, trans, uh, transsexuals, in the Sangar case where there were a number of um, uh, where, where social welfare obligations and royalties with regards to exploration production uh, oil exploration and production companies were enforced upon the government. Uh, none of this is taken into account by those two articles uh, because the, they're basically written from a position of privilege. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of space to explore that. And they also uh, have failed to take into account 
a very expansive volume of work on this subject, which was produced about one year before this book. Uh, so and I think that's one area which could merit greater exploration, particularly uh, in context of the work of the Indian Supreme Court, which is perhaps even more activist than uh, Chief Justice Chaudhary and his successor, Chief Justice Khwaja, were. Uh, and also, uh, Chief Justice Chaudhary in particular provides uh, a study of what you said is lacking in the Pakistan Supreme Court or in the Indian Supreme Court, in the sense that he had eight and a half years as uh, Chief Justice of Pakistan. Well, take out the two years that he was deposed. Still six and a half years as Chief Justice of Pakistan, in which we can provide, uh, in which uh, study of the jurisprudence of one d particularly dominant judge can be provided from a perspective which uh, would be, could be perhaps more unbiased than those of the given in this book. Thank you. Um, so I, I <coughs> excuse, thank, you, thank you for the comment. Uh, uh, it is, I mean, you're obviously accurate in reading the contributions about Pakistan. They do come from uh, people who are um, skeptical about the exercise of judicial power. Um, and that in itself may be of some interest. Uh, um, so uh, uh, Prada Mehta's uh, paper is also skeptical in the context of, of India. Um, and, and one question to uh, be explored is uh, sort of about the, call it the intellectual history of these kinds of uh, writing. And in particular, uh, for me, uh, whether <clears throat> that those perspectives are, uh, I'll say, unduly influenced by U.S. constitutional theorizing, uh, where um, I would sort of want to trace who's citing Alexander Bickel on the contra-majoritarian difficulty, uh, which you know, it dominates my way of thinking about U.S. constitutional law, but may well be, I mean, I know it is inappropriate uh, in other contexts. So, um, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, right? I can just add, uh, I, I think Professor Tashan makes a very interesting um, point about thinking about intellectual influences of those of us who do comparative constitutional law, um, and also how ideas change over time. So one of the things that struck me was, and this is something I wasn't aware of, today in India there's a general consensus among scholars at least that India's basic structure doctrine, you know, you might quibble about how it's used, but the doctrine itself is something to be proud of, something to venerate, something to keep up. Uh, but reading, um, uh, I think, um, Sujit so Chaudhary's piece points out that when the judgment actually came out in 74, some of the most progressive scholars uh, in India wrote pieces denouncing an, usur an usurpation of judicial power uh, against democratic forces. Um, and I think that also helps explain what's happening in Pakistan. So I think, at least from reading uh, Muhammad Wasim and Osama Siddiq's pieces, uh, they also gesture to the fact that um, while Chaudhary, Justice Chaudhary was able to reinvent the court post-2007, it also obscured the fact that the court and Justice Chaudhary himself was complicit in the past with uh, many of the things that today he was critical of. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, judicializing uh, the coup in 2001. So I think some of that narrative comes out of a skepticism about... Uh, but that, 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 that's when you also get caught up in the immediacy of politics and maybe looking at this 20 years later when you see what the actual impact of Chaudhary II is, uh, maybe one would evaluate, evaluate this, this area differently. Yeah, I'll, tell, I'll just uh, add in there. Um, in terms of... How migration of constitutional ideas. And I think you're right to point out that uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh do cite India. They do cite each other, although Bangladesh has this, um, when it's citing Pakistani judgments, it's changed over time. And again, sometimes it's reacting against Pakistan because of the history that's been there. But one thing that I've noticed just from spending a bit of time teaching in Pakistan, a bit of time in Bangladesh, and even less time in in Sri Lanka and Nepal is, at least in terms of the interpretation of India, it comes to this really kind of felter, kind of one-dimensional view of what's going on. So an example of that, I remember talking to some of my students in Pakistan about the right to food case in India, which for those of you who don't know is perhaps one of the biggest social and economic rights cases in the world, where the Indian Supreme Court over a series of order, orders over many years um, uh, really gets into the structuring of major social welfare programs in India. 
And one of the things that was striking to me in discussions with people in Pakistan about this was the lack of, of appreciation for the, the large kind of civil society movement behind this, how this fit into Indian politics more broadly. Um, and that if you just looked at the newspaper accounts or if you just looked at the orders, even worse, um, you'd get a very kind of skewed vision of how um, politics, uh, of how, how judgments are being um, interpreted in, um, in India and in these other countries. And, and I do think besides the judges talking to each other, some extent and reading each other's judgments, one of the other places this is happening is some of the social activist groups, although not as much as you'd think, do have some communication amongst each other. So some of the groups involved in kind of public interest litigation in these different countries. And one of the earliest books that I know of, of that's kind of an edited volume across South Asia is looking at public interest litigation in South Asia and kind of the, but again, it means if you look at public interest litigation, it ends up meaning very kind of different yeah. things in each of these, these contexts. Um, and part of that's like a misunderstanding and part of that's an adaptation. There's a gentleman. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, Dan. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you spoke about unintended consequences, and I just wanted to link this to one of the ideas uh, Upendra Bakshi has spoken about uh, the way postcolonial constitutions in Asia and I think elsewhere have tended to uh, be more structural and less um, uh, justice pursuing. So structural in the sense that uh, issues to do with uh, separation of powers, division of powers, uh, federalism and so forth are overrepresented in those constitutions. And as a result, uh, therefore, um, uh, it suggests uh, that, I wonder whether that would be one of the sources, I know that you spoke about the sources of instability. Uh, number two is, um, in terms of state formation in Asia and elsewhere, like in Africa, uh, there's a Pakistani um, uh, uh, scholar who has spoken about the um, overdeveloped administrative state, uh, the sense in which um, the administrative state uh, preceded uh, the political state. And by that, I think he compares uh, the Americas, for instance, that before you, you had the, uh, d uh, the formation of the constitution, that there had been all these processes that were political and democratic. So I wonder to what extent, in terms of, of that historical legacy, the overdeveloped state is perhaps also uh, one of the uh, causes of this uh, unstable constitutionalism. Uh, um, Go ahead. Um, so I, I think you're, you're right on, on both grounds, except that I think one of the things that South Asia shows is how a lot of the structural elements get infused with justice, with meanings that one would attribute to justice. So it's interesting that, um, I mean, I, I saw a little bit of the Nepali constitutional drafting thing um, working with some of the Constitutional Assembly members, and one would have assumed the contentious questions would be things like, gay rights or um, sexual autonomy for women and things like that. All of that seemed to have passed without, without, without any demur. What they really got stuck on was uh, naming of provinces and sharing of taxation powers. Because what was essentially, what seemed to be a straightforward administrative structural question was actually a question of accommodating ethnic minorities in the south uh, in, within the larger structure. So um, um, the debate was often framed in technical structural terms, but there was a larger question of um, community or, or a regional or community justice that was that was tied to it. Um, the second bit is also how certain you know the Indian Constitution is really long and, and wordy and it has everything in it, including uh, references to the Auditor General, um, which is essentially a bureaucratic figure that audits accounts. Um, but over the last 10 years, and this comes through Pratap Mehta's uh, article here, the Auditor General becomes a figure who is holding the government to accountability. 
and in a way destabilizes in some ways just the auditor general's report destabilizes the last the last government because he's able to show that not only is there actual corruption there are sort of massive losses that the state incurs because of corruption which becomes a pu- public figure so i think um, the distinction we make between structural and justice based is, is is not limited and there is possibilities of change uh, on your second point i I, th- i think that's absolutely right and that's partly why some of these the the administrative state preceding political society is one of the reasons why many of these situations remain unstable um so the, i just wanted to make one comment and it's about <clears throat> the limitations of my perspective um uh which is and it is that <clears throat> i don't find myself well positioned to talk about uh neo colonialist legacies I, i partly it's a matter of i'd say nervousness uh about the north south critique that i am from the north and you know the critique of neo colonialism should at some level come from the from the south but it's also uh a lack of um i don't know what the right word is facility or comfort in in talking about that on on the uh I just want to agree with you and and Rohit about the importance of the administrative state preceding the constitutional state or the or the political nation um that's that seems to be just absolutely right it's also again from my point of view it's not the way i think about things but it's clearly uh, true um just I, on an anecdotal level as is i don't want to uh, general generalize but it's the kind of thing that drives home the significance of this uh i've been to pakistan once uh and for like a 10 day uh teaching uh exercise uh and um as part of it we were uh the organizers uh took us to a, a number of institutions uh, to meet people in, in the institutions and at one of them was we had lunch at the uh training school for high level military uh, people who were going to be in high level military it was like uh the raj i mean it was just you know this it was all the it just felt like you know india in as i understood it to be india in 1925 except that the it wasn't british aristocrats and bureaucrats who were in charge it was pakistani but the social relations were the same as i imagined the relations in in 1925 Anything else? Okay, so we've run through our hour. I have. Oh, thank you all for uh, coming. Someone there. Oh yeah, sorry. Sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's a... I think there are two questions. So the first one is in India. Uh, you mentioned right to food and the movement around civil society and bringing in socio-economic sort of rights-based acts. uh um, it also involves an interpretation of article 21 i think right to life and it's a very broad based this thing and i have i'm not a lawyer but i've spoken to a lot of people just you know i come from an economic side trying to understand so there the principles that drive the interpretation of right to life and it's a fairly uh the ambit is just wide i mean there are i mean for me i mean i want some principles that guide it uh which sort of brings into mind this concept of unstable constitutionalism it just keeps growing so one is that and the second one is something about the federal sort of structure we're seeing this churn going through almost all the countries so i would like to like know your viewpoint about how we see the constitutions evolving or just the dynamics yeah. okay so i'll just say a couple of things about each of those one one is the the right to life um the is from the point of view of a comparative constitutional scholar uh one of the most interesting things about the development of the uh indian doctrine of socioeconomic rights is uh the interpretive way that the con- that the supreme court got there um as as people may or may not know um there are there is a set of uh of socioeconomic rights in the indian constitution 
but it's in a separate part of the Constitution, which, as a matter of original understanding, although it turns out not as a matter of text, was supposed to be non-justiciable. Uh, and then the Indian Supreme Court said, well, there is this justiciable right to life, and all the stuff that's in this, these directive principles can be interpreted as implementing the right to, to life. It's a very interesting interpretive move. <clears throat> um, the Indian structure is uh, based on the Irish Constitution of 37. In Ireland, they didn't do that at all. Um, the text in Ireland is a little um, clearer in foreclosing justiciability. Um, on the basic structure doctrine, doctrine and, and unamendability, which, which Rohit mentioned as a, uh, something that is admired uh, in India, <clears throat> it, um, there are origins elsewhere, uh, but the notion of a judicially enforceable doctrine of unamendability uh, is an Indian contribution and uh, has spread uh, extremely um, widely around the world. Um, there's now uh, an enormous, not enormous, but a quite substantial literature in comparative constitutional law on the idea of, un uh, of unamend unamendability, uh, of which the basic structure doctrine is a subset. Uh, but it's been now generalized. And uh, there's... The, the literature is interesting in its attempt to um, accommodate, if at all possible, um, the ideas originating in India uh, with, uh, call it, core democratic theory. Um, it's, it's just, it's a, now it's a, the Indian Supreme Court has done a lot to push forward really rather deep consideration of serious foundational issues of constitutionalism. So, Okay, so we will stop now. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, and On behalf of the library, I'd like to thank Professor Tisch